can take all this great stuff that we know and love about open source and improve our leadership in our different organizations. So Jim, come on up. All right. All right, thank you, Jason. Well, first off, let me welcome you all to our hometown, Raleigh, North Carolina. We really do appreciate you all coming to visit us. And I have to say, speaking for my wife and my kids, it was really nice to be able to go to a keynote but sleep in my own bed last night and have breakfast with the kids. So all four more doing uh, more things here. And so if you have time, I hope you have a chance to come visit the tower. We're about two blocks away. You can't miss it. It has the big red thing on the top. Um, so I really do appreciate you all being here. Um, I do encourage you to find Charlie at some point during this, uh, listen to him uh, from the video. It really is a, a phenomenal and really inspirational uh, story. That was just a short trailer. You can go to the site that was up there, Red Hat, I guess Red Hat.com slash Red Hat Stories, and there's the full video there. It really is an extraordinary and inspirational story about what all uh, he's achieved at Penn Manor. I'd like to broaden the conversation since this is all things open. I'm actually not going to talk about technology today. And all right, I'm already causing problems. I'm supposed to stay in these yellow lines and I'm already outside of them. I'm always the troublemaker, which is a problem. Everybody else like stayed right on time. And you know, so, all right, I'll just try to do a better job here. So um, I'd like to, to broaden the conversation since this is all things open and talk about open as it applies to literally management to business uh, and to our society. Open source is a key part of that, um, but I do think what we are all looking to achieve um, actually has implications far beyond uh, just software. They're black and white. It's new. Um, let me start off broadly with why I think there is such a need for the principles of open source. I'm saying the principles of open source because open source itself is a license. It's uh, about source code. Yet we talk often at Red Hat about the open source way, which is how we apply those principles beyond technology and open source software itself. Now, if we think about the world we've come from, and the world we are entering into, it's been a long change, and I'll come into a little bit how all of a sudden I recognized, at least personally, this change. But if you think about the Industrial Revolution that we came from, we, can't, we have come from a world, mass manufacturing, you know, developed in the late 1800s, where we basically had, and this is simplification, but relatively uneducated people, meaning most people did not have a high school degree, typically doing rote tasks, most tasks because the way we actually work to specialize, you know, science and management specialization, people were doing relatively rote tasks, on, typically on assembly lines, in a very static environment, right? Business and strategy changed over decades, certainly not over years, months, or frankly, it feels like weeks now. Um, in a world where we had no information, or say, very limited information that was very latent. Right? If you're lucky, you had a telegraph. Um, so basically, when we started thinking about how we develop principles of management, leadership, how we coordinate behavior, it happened in a world of a very different context. Again, relatively uneducated people doing relatively rote tasks, static environment with limited information. If we think about where we are today in the context that we all live in, we typically have certainly much better educated people than we did, even though we need to continue to work on things like high school graduation rates. They are typically well above 80%, certainly in the US. Many of the people that we all work with and employ, probably most that we actually work with and employ have college degrees. In a world where we've automated the rote tasks, so most tasks out there that need to be done broadly, and certainly in IT, require a degree of initiative and cre uh, creativity. In an incredibly fast-changing environment where we have unlimited broadband information in our pockets. So when you think about that context of the world we live in today and how different it looks before, 
how we need to think about coordinating behavior, how we need to think about leadership and management needs to change. And if you want to say the traditional world of hierarchy has got to open up, and let me try to talk a little bit more in detail about that. So we've all seen this in technology. We've gone from a world where 75 or 80% of our effort was around sustaining and a very little bit was about innovation. And that goes in terms of both dollars and time and attention. Um, those generally often go together. To a world where I think most of us recognize in technology, but broadly for business, sustaining becomes less important. Our ability to, innovation, uh, to innovate becomes dramatically more important. And one thing that we absolutely know is that the traditional hierarchies, the closed systems that we've used to manage, to coordinate activity, are really, really bad at innovation. Nobody says, give me a great bureaucracy so I can come up with something new, right? And I think we see that happening as well uh, as we think about how we work and become more efficient, how we move more quickly, how we innovate in information technology. So DevOps uh, is kind of the buzzword, at least with every CIO, uh, CIO I talk to now. Um, everybody's, whether it's um, agile for the maybe less bleeding edge or DevOps for the more bleeding edge, almost every conversation I have with CIOs now is talking about how do we move faster. And what I hear over and over and over again is disillusionment because everybody's figured out the joke now. It's not about the tools, right? Tools are important. Certainly, you have to have enabling technologies uh, to increase speed, efficiency, ability to innovate. But so many companies have bought the tools, thrown them into their traditional ways of operating, and they have fallen on their face. Right? It just doesn't happen. And it's actually quite fascinating. When I now go out, and I do have a, I have a great job, I have to say. I get to go out and talk to you know, the web companies. I get to go talk to just large uh, 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 corporate CIOs and CEOs. And I get, so I get to feel like I'm on the front line of getting to watch this change happening around us. And I can say absolutely virtually everyone I talk to, there is a recognition now that something other than technology needs to change. That the way we organize the cultures that we are involved in uh, need to change if we're going to be able to keep pace with the faster moving world that we live in. So I actually wrote a book about that. Um, and let me spend just a couple minutes on it because I think this, this is important, how I actually came to this because A, I'm not that smart, to, certainly not to write a book. Actually, my English teachers would be horrified with the idea, you know, that I ever wrote a book. Plus, it's about people, and I actually, this is a true story, I failed human resource management at Harvard Business School, so maybe that gives me a real reason to write a book. But no, in all seriousness, I, I, I wrote a book not about what I've done, but about what I've learned. I think I've gotten probably the greatest gift that a CEO or an aspiring leader could possibly get, and that is I'll use the analogy, I'm the frog that got thrown in the boiling water. And what I mean by that is the world has been changing from this need to uh, be efficient and proscribing kind of classic industrial era world of bureaucracy and how we lead and manage and all of those things slowly over the last 50 years to a world where things are moving incredibly quickly and the bureaucracies, centralized planning and budgeting and all those things cannot keep up, nor can they just do as good a job at innovating as enabling people. But most of us are the frogs that are, if you know this analogy, that are in kind of the cold water that slowly heats up, heats up, heats up, and you don't really realize anything's changing. And I would say until I got to Red Hat, I thought I knew what management leadership was about. I used to run a large company, uh, Delta Airlines, which is about as military bureaucratic as you can get. And then I came to Red Hat. And in my first week of Red Hat, I thought, this is the most crazy, ridiculous place I've ever seen. It is totally and complete chaos. They've obviously brought me in, uh, in there to clean it up. And 
we had more time, I could go on story after story after story, but literally I would tell people to do things and they would just say, no, that's not a good idea. We're not going to do that. You know? <laughs> now at Delta, literally when I drove in in the morning, there were people who would uh, salute me when I came, seriously. So this contrast was extraordinary. And so again, at first I thought I need to clean this place up. And luckily, before I had a chance to do this, the organization wore me down before I could make enough change to happen. And I actually realized that what we had developed at Red Hat was a different way to run an organization, but one that was extremely effective. We made several significant strategic decisions without me even being involved in that first six months. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, this isn't chaos. It is a different way to run an organization. And the reason I'm talking about it here is it literally grew out of the open source movement. Red Hat as a company is all in on open source. We are 21 years old now, and we literally grew out of the open source movement. And Red Hat is an, exper an experiment in applying the principles of open source for how you run an organization. The, the book's called The Open Organization. Um, and this is kind of our definition, an organi organization that engages participative communities inside and out. I wanna focus on two words here because I think these are fundamental to any company that wants to move more quickly, and certainly any IT department that wants to move more quickly. The first word there is participative. We come typically from an era where employees were considered a commodity. They were price takers. I mean, take the, going back to the industrial revolution, you know, it was, you got paid a lot more to work in a factory than work on a farm, and people were moving from farms to urban areas. And so our management structures that we developed assumed people were just price takers. They would come work, and it was easy to get people. I think we all now know as we try to, A, not only attract the best and the brightest, but more importantly, to get people to do more than just what you tell them, to actually be engaged, to be part of an organization, um, to go above and beyond, you need to treat your people like they are participants, like they have a choice of where they should be. And I encourage any leader, and certainly this is true, anyone who's been involved in an open source community knows this and we talk about it a lot, why are people coming in? Why are they joining? You think really hard about it and you make it or, um, the organization's things that people want to join, right? It has to be, you know, when you just kind of back up and say, why are the people here? Is it for a paycheck or is it because they want to be here? Open source started off this way because there were no paychecks, right? It was get people to do it because they wanted to be a part of things. But every organization needs to start off thinking about their people as opt-in members of a community. And the second piece of word I'll, I'll say is that engages. I've been asked simply, if you had to put it in one sentence, what are you saying next generation kind of leaders need to think about doing? And it truly, it's about creating the context for people to do their best work. And that's all about engagement, right? How do you create that context? Now, how do you engage people to be part of something so that they not only do they want to be a part of it, but they know exactly how they need to play a part in that? Now, for Red Hat, we developed a whole system to run a company that's now 8,000 people, $2 billion in revenue this year, operating in a lot of countries. I don't know the exact number, probably 40-ish, 50-ish countries. Um, I'm going to walk through some examples of this, but I want to spend a minute before I walk through this contextualizing it. This isn't quite in the book. I hope at some point you may read the book. But um, importantly, there is no theory management 2.0 paradigm out there. When I was writing this book, I got asked often, well, are you describing a new paradigm, a new kind of management kind of theory? And I scratched my head because I never really thought about it. And I've now come to the conclusion about, no, I'm not. And here's the simple reason why. Thinking about any type of participative community, this is true of any open source community, I would argue any kind of organization that is adopting open principles, by definition moves you out of a comfort zone of a clear theory knowledge paradigm. It's a lot like economics. So 
there are a lot of par parallels between classical economics and classical management. They both developed late 1800s, early 1900s, about the same time. And economics and management basically developed um, using the same set of simplifying assumptions, right? These were social sciences. So this is trying to apply science to people and behavior. And the classic way to do that it, around the turn of the century was, all right, we got to make it a science and therefore we have to make the math work and we have to have generalized theories. And so for economics, to make the math work, you had to make some simplifying assumptions like people are always rational, there's perfect information, and markets are in equilibrium. And we know none of those things are true. And if you ever take a microeconomics class, you know, the last two lectures, you know, the professor would say, well, we know none of that stuff's true now, but we had to make the simplifying assumptions to make the math work, right? So upward sloping uh, supply curve, downward sloping demand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we know people aren't always rational. We know that, and in fact, if you look today, virtually every major university's economics department has a behavioral economics department specialty within that. Right? And behavioral economics basically says we know people aren't rational, and so let's study that. We know people have all kind of uh, biases. They have a, they're relatively over-optimistic. Um, we typically value today more than tomorrow, and so because we're all rational, we would all weigh exactly what we want to weigh. We would all save exactly how much we want to um, uh, save for retirement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we know those things don't happen. So we've developed a new kind of set of economics. And if, if you want to read a great book, you know, there's a book called Freakonomics. And it's a great book that kind of goes through some of the quirky behaviors that human beings have around um, kind of not being totally rational. Management made the same assumptions that economics made, which is people are rational. And really, this is why, it's more of an aside, but this is why the, um, in, in the literature for the last 50 years, there's been a bifurcation of management and leadership. That was another question I got asked a lot. Are you writing a book about management or leadership? And I always scratch my head and say, well, I'm not sure. And if you look out there, you can read tons of things talking about, well, what's the difference between management and leadership? Well, I've come to realize the difference between management and leadership is very simply because management, in the way we classically thought of it, made the simplifying assumption that people are totally rational, i.e. will only work for a paycheck and do what they're told, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's imbued in all the aspects of management theory. And leadership is the other piece which realize people aren't always rational. We are emotional beings. Things like inspiration, morale, et cetera, matter. And so, but we split those apart. And what I think we're starting to see is those things, things need to come back together. And so I would argue that as we go forward, you will see less of a bifurcation of management and leadership as we, as we've done in open source communities, recognize we have to coordinate behavior, but these are people who have, you know, motivations other than, the, you know, complete economically rational. People do it because they love to or because they like being parts of community, because they feel like they're doing good things for the world, right? Those are all abstracted away in classical economics and in, in classical management. The reason I spent uh, such a long time talking about that, and I really will walk through a few components of this, is in the same way that there is no grand unifying theory of behavioral economics because the math's too hard, as soon as you say people are irrational, the math gets really hard, and so there is no grand unifying kind of economics 2.0, you know, behavioral economics grand theory. There is no grand theory of management, right? We're all stumbling along trying to figure out how to best inspire, lead, et cetera. So what the book's about is what Red Hat has done to unlock the potential and the power of our people. And it really is the principles of open source. I'm going to walk through a few of them quickly here. Obviously happy to engage more through the course of the day um, uh, or meet me outside. I think I'm signing books later. We can talk more about it. Um, first off, purpose and passion are critical. And I think we all kind of know this, but as managers, we often forget this. And I talk to CIOs about this all the time. You have to connect what your people are doing every day to the broader purpose of the company, right? And people just forget. They're like, well, you know, people can go read the mission statement, et cetera, et cetera. You have to connect people to the purpose of the company beyond getting a paycheck. And I 
I'd say that over and over and over again because we all kind of know it, but we all often forget it. For Red Hat, we really work to ignite that with passion. We talk about open source. We talk about what we're doing in the world. We do videos like the ones you see. Those are certainly for external, but they also continue to bring home the power of all the code we give away and what that ultimately does for society. This is one measure of that. How many people in your company have your company's logo tattooed? Those are not fake. Those are real tattoos. Um, those are uh, three Red Hatters that we actually got together at Summit this year or have the tattoos. That is commitment to a brand. Um, so we're not changing our brand, not to pick on the Google guys, but you read the article, they changed their brand and there's a guy with the Google tattoo who's upset. So I always threaten these guys. There really was an article about that. So I always threaten these guys, if, if, if they piss me off, I'm gonna change the logo, just kidding. <laughs> But I cannot overestimate that. And I think people who are leaders in open source communities recognize the importance of that to attract the best and the brightest to their communities. Next, you really have to engage. And again, I spend a lot of time talking to CIOs about this when their tools, they, they buy the shiniest, best you know, DevOps tools and fall flat on their face. It's like, well, have you really deeply engaged with the people in your organization about the whys of, of, of what they're doing, what you're trying to accomplish? Have you really engaged and listened to them? We use very simple tools, by the way. Memo list is one of our many email lists. Yes, we are a tech company and we use email lists to basically collaborate and it works phenomenally well. And it works phenomenally well because I contribute and listen. Our the senior executives are on there listening, contributing. It, our people know that if there's an issue that's important, they can post there and everyone in the company is going to see it. Engagement is critical, critical, critical. And we certainly, in open source communities, really deeply making sure the top teams um, and then flowing all the way through to all participants are all working together on, on the same mailing list that people understand direction and the what's and the why's is absolutely critical. Meritocracy. Let me just tell you one quick story. I put Kubernet um, uh, up here. Yeah, so Kubernetes the company that had the key developers of KVM, which is the primary hypervisor that underlies, um, well, OpenStack, and it's underlying our product. I remember my first month at Red Hat, I'm in a meeting with my head of products and technology, our CTO and head of engineering, a person who then was running virtualization engineering, and then an engineer in that group. And they were talking about why, this was eight years ago, you know, we were supporting Zen as our core hypervisor. And you know, we're kind of going through this. And, and the engineer in there said, yeah, yeah, this is what we're doing, but I really think it's wrong. We really need to be behind KVM because you know, a whole bunch of reasons, part of the Linux kernel and you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here thinking, and you know, the others in the room are arguing with them, but very happy to have an open debate in front of the CEO. And I remember going home and telling my wife, you know, at Delta, if an engineer or somebody in an area of the organization in front of his boss and his boss's boss's boss and his boss's boss's boss said to the CEO, yeah, I just completely disagree with what those guys are doing, that guy would have been fired so fast. At Red Hat, we celebrate that, right? We love it when people disagree. We, ha we argue things out, we fight, till we ultimately get the best solution. By the way, nine months later, we bought that company for $108 million, so I guess he was right. Um, I think this is another important thing, and this is one of the one, by the way, that I think I, I get the most shocked when I talk to CIOs about, all right, how do you build an organization capable of moving faster and innovating faster is, it's not about holding hands and singing kumbaya. Any of you involved in productive open source communities know that it often gets heated. And matter of fact, by the way, the whole concept of you know, brainstorming, which is what most of us think about, was developed in the 1950s. Tons of research to show it doesn't work, right? Celebrating everyone's ideas doesn't work. You get better answers if uh, ultimately you have people, you know, kind of uh, fighting things out. When you get people saying, I agree with this, or, uh, or I don't agree with this, or that's a bad idea. If an idea is a bad idea, say it's a bad idea. You know, un unfortunately, uh, the Linux uh, community takes that to an extreme where I think many of us think that it's not fully productive. Uh, but recognizing the importance of having the right debate, having frank, open conversations is a key part in any organization of ensuring that uh, you get the best answer. 
And then finally, this is our mission statement. This mission statement, I'll spend a, a second on, to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners building better technology the open source way. The first draft of this said, we, are, uh, we, uh, we aspire to be the leader in dot, 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 dot. And our developers came back and said, well, that's not true. We don't lead these communities. So we came back with the second version and said, our mission is to be an active participant in dot, dot, dot. And the same developer said, no, that's not accurate because we aspire to drive direction. And of course, I'm saying, so, well, are we leaders or are we participants? And they came back and said, well, we're neither. And this, again, is a change from the typical bureaucracy or, or, or not. They came back and said, we are the catalyst in communities. Because we are there, because of our contributions, we can influence direction. And so that's why Red Hat and virtually every community we're involved in, we're the largest or second largest contributor to those communities because we need to catalyze direction. We don't order um, uh, people to do things, we catalyze direction. And as leaders on our best days, and I tell CIOs this all the time, catalyze direction because ultimately you, you get to better uh, uh, answers, you get more and deeper levels of engagement. If we, meaning all of us in open source, our organizations, for those of you who are enterprise users, broadly for management teams in general, if we are going to maximize the, the innovation potential of our organizations and ultimately for society as a whole, we have got to adopt a new approach. I got lucky, I was the frog that got thrown in the boiling water, I'm now out there evangelizing. We've got to move to a post-industrial era way that we organize and lead. And open source is just an extraordinary um, metaphor, uh, example of how to do that at scale. Um, so I'll leave you with one last thought. No organization can predict the future of technology. All of us, a co coalition of us, will build it. And that's true with whether it's being the default choice in next generation IT infrastructure or more broadly, uh, IoT generating kind of how we will construct the economy going forward. So I hope you enjoy the next couple of days. We really do appreciate you having us here in our town and I look forward to getting a chance to chat with more of you along the way. Thank you.